Welcome to Armchair Preaching, a podcast of the First Presbyterian Church in Lakeland, Florida. This is a podcast about God's Word, the beauty of the gospel, and what it takes to communicate that truth to others. I'm your host, Pastor Zach McGowan, and I'm pleased to be joined by Josh Schweitzer, FPC Student Ministry Director, as we talk about our sermons on adoption. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Welcome back, everybody, to Armchair Preaching uh, today in the Armchair. Another special guest last week, we had Ed Diaz. This week, we have Josh Schweitzer, who is on staff as our student ministries director. That's your official title, is that right? Did I get that yes, right? Not yes. you, we don't call it youth director here. No, it's very wordy, and yeah. I honestly don't remember it half the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not director of student ministry no, here. No. It's, yeah, it's and very, I uh, inadequately call myself a youth pastor, although in the Presbyterian circles, that's... The word pastor is very yeah. sacrosanct <laughs> in our in our circles. And I do it on purpose, really, yeah, to kind of right. jab uh, you real yeah. pastors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> real pastors. You do a lot of real pastoral work, though, which I sure. do want to talk about a little bit here as, as it relates to your message just the some of the work that you do with with our with our students and and uh, with the leaders as well too because I think one of the things that people don't realize is a big part of your ministry and in student ministry in general if it's done well it is working a lot with students it's working a lot with their parents but then also impacting the adult leaders that walk alongside our students as well too so um, i do want to talk a little bit about some of that and how um, because of the way you, you you kicked off your message this past sunday inviting the congregation to kind of think through engagement with young people based on some of these things so I, i'm going to get your take on how you sure. make those 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 bridges as you said bridging those gaps but just to remind folks, you know, you've been on the podcast before. Um, yep. You have preached um, a few times here in our church. You preached a few times in other con- congregations, so you've got experience doing that. Here, this was the first week that you have preached in our classic service. That's right. Um, yeah. You've done a couple in Vine, and uh, which is our modern service. How did you? How do you experience those two contexts and and the differences, the challenges, the joys of those two different contexts? That's a great question. Uh, you know, so when I first started ministry at my kind of first big church, uh, uh, they allowed me to cut my teeth on adult preaching uh, yeah. with the older congregation. They kind of had um, actually kind of much like we do a, a hybrid, uh, classical, and then kind of a, a modern. And so, you know. That was fantastic. I, yeah. I think it was the best way for me to start uh, yeah. preaching to adults. Um, for one, they're so much more gracious in the sense that they're like, we understand you're, you're a young person coming in here, and yeah. we're just excited that the next generation is doing something like that. Um, but what I also uh, gained from it was, um, you know, there are vast cultural differences between the generations. Yeah. and. When speaking to each one, what I try to do as a preacher is I'm I'm trying to understand who my crowd is mm-hmm. and speak to them in such a way that, um, that not just that they're receiving information, but that they're able to go out and do something with it. But every generation is different yeah. and in the vehicle of delivering mm-hmm. that message, and so it I don't know it keeps me it keeps me. Um, sharpened i think as a preacher to Mm -hmm. to to approach each different age group differently yeah i think that is one of the the gifts that our congregation has for us as as leaders Um, whether it's pastor john or me or rebecca pastor rebecca or you or brian morgan or or you know ed diaz or paul switch and we have a we have a we have a pretty deep bench here mm-hmm. um but we all get the opportunity to preach in different contexts and that does it keeps us sharp it keeps us you know because in a lot of churches it's a very um you know one size fits all model yeah. and so the preachers get used to preaching in one context to one type of you know, one type of audience, one type of congregation, whereas our congregation is multifaceted. And, and I enjoy that. I, I enjoy the, uh, the, Same, yeah. the cycles, too. But this was also, too, one of the things that was different. It is different, especially currently in post-pandemic world um, or in the, this season of, of COVID that we're still kind of living in or, or is that 
we have a hybrid model of worship. So you have an online church and you have a uh, in-person church. And with the classic service, that's really unique. The the, the audience at home that's that's listening to this podcast and is uh, they are aware that we record our classic service in advance right, yeah. on Thursday. That was your first time doing something yes, like that. Yeah. Was that the first time well, you've ever preached like that? First time. No, 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 no. no audience though. No, no. During uh, the, the church I was at prior, we transitioned. We did like a Thursday night preaching sort of thing. Okay. And so when I came on board, COVID had just rolled out. Yeah. Uh, just in time for COVID. Uh, so we in had, your previous church. Yes, yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was. I got to. And by the way, I was awful at it. Um, mm-hmm. The eye contact thing when there's no one in. Yeah. You know. So we're in the same area that we normally would be preaching, and there's no one there. Uh, you know. I'm. I tend to be, um, uh, well, you, you're the same way. We're, yeah. we're very um, uh, passionate Demonstrative, people. It's, yeah. it's so much harder to do that when it's literally you and a camera, maybe like a guy eating breakfast in the, in the background. <laughs> That's, right. That's, right. You know? That's right. Yeah, um, and you're preaching You're preaching to the audience that you can't see. Right, yeah. Yeah, we had to – when we first started doing that here, um, when that – I we had to shift gears very quickly because – it was uh, – I remember the conversations me and Pastor Kenny and Pastor John having when we moved towards – well, for a long time we were online only, mm-hmm. and so there were Sunday, 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 where we were just in an empty room with just you know a few members of the band and or a few members of the choir or whatever, and us, and, and, and that – you know, it feels like you're practicing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and when you, when you practice a sermon – you practice scanning the room and you practice the movement, but when there's nobody in the room and everybody knows there's nobody in the room, that feels really weird. Yeah. So we had to we had to devise some techniques to <laughs> keep us locked in like like almost like news anchors on that mm-hmm. that one camera, you know. We we literally built googly eyes above the camera just so that you you could look at some eyes yeah. to kind of train yourself to look in the direction but I, I think even for the viewer even though they understand that that there's an empty room it yeah. is odd to be staring directly back at the preacher you know yeah. <laughs> like when he's not kind of scanning the room you're just yeah. like oh well, this is unbroken uh, yeah. eye contact <laughs> he's staring into yourself yeah, I, yeah. we literally are preaching to you at yes, that point yeah, yeah. it's like you point. can imagine that yeah. uh, well, well now, i gotta ask you this after doing it for about a year and a half i begin i begin to get some, a weird burnout from it oh it, shoot, it just yes. wasn't good yeah we we um i remember um it was this summer 2020 so we we began opening back up to in person in September of 2020. Um, so we had been online only from March 15th to September. And I remember, I, I can, I remember this day and I don't remember which Sunday it was, but, um, and we were cycling at that point preacher. So it would be, um, John for two weeks, and then me for a week, and then Kenny for a week, right? So, to to try to avoid or to try to lengthen out that that mm. that 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 burnout side, and we we did some interesting things too because all of the services were in Loudon Hall. We we did a, a singular um, um, kind of a you know hybrid kind of or, or, or modified blended sort of deal but it was all in Loudon Hall so we actually had because we were very blessed technologically we actually to, to make it a little bit more interesting for the audience and a little bit more interesting for us to get people's attention we set up different um, almost different background sets okay so we had like the assistant on one side of the room with like a uh, kind of a set and they did everything from one side and it was lit for them and then the preacher basically in the normal spot and then you had the, the band on the stage so you had these three kind of levels um which which helped combat some of that but i do remember middle of july uh 2020 driving in and I, uh, I got to the point, you know, I wasn't, I didn't park in parking spaces. I mean, I just parked right up at the door, <laughs> yeah, you know, just in, just yeah, in the nobody, yard because nobody yeah. was there. Yeah. And I remember very distinctly, like getting out of my car on a Sunday morning, which you know typically has so much energy and there's so much, um, so much joy and getting to say hello to people. And even when you're checking in with people that are 
you know, sick or hurting. And there's just that 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 connection and that that um, sense of family. And I just remember that had been gone for you know mm-hmm. three months at that point, and just like this deep sense of depression. You know, just like I I, I don't want to I don't want to do this. Doesn't feel um, it doesn't feel it doesn't feel like worshiping God in a, in a, in a communal way. It doesn't feel right. And, and I'm so glad that we have that option for people that, that can't be in person. Um, and I was speaking to a couple yet on Sunday and, and, um, numerous medical issues. And so they often are in online worship, Mm -hmm. but she was, she came in and she just looked at me and she goes, it's so much better when you're here. It's just so much better. So, but I'm glad that we do have that option. It's a blessing that we can keep people connected, but man, you're right. It's, it's really tough, but you did a great job by the way, Uh, because I, I watched, I had, because I'm watching after the fact, um, I watch on you know I watched on Monday mm-hmm. and uh, I thought man he did a, he did a bang up job keeping <laughs> connected you. and staying energetic without it feeling weird because that's yeah. the balance you get over <laughs> you get overly energetic yeah. uh, it's like it's like a different thing so you know this week we were talking about we're in this Ordo Saluta series mm-hmm. um, and y- you and I kind of come you know I've been in the series for a while so what was it so I want to ask this this is what is it like to jump into the middle of a series when you haven't been prepping the messages each week? You've been listening, you know, participating as a congregant, but even that has a different feel. Um, what was it like? What is it like to jump in mid-series? Yeah, well, and because I typically go to Vine, so I'm kind of hearing yours and a little bit of like John's the tape, version yeah. in Vine. I didn't really have a lot of context for what was being said yeah. in class, and had I <laughs> been a better person, I probably would have done my due diligence and yeah. gone through all those uh, messages, but I won't. I'll throw myself under the bus. <laughs> so so I think that's the hardest part is contextually knowing um, everyone's kind of laying, in, in a series like this, everyone's laying groundwork, and thankfully in, in the order of salvation, it kind of lines up. Yeah. But I think you could agree there's a lot of bleeding in all Absolutely. of these. Yeah. Uh, so, so my biggest concern was I don't want to re-repeat Yeah what's already come before and and in particular to adoption you know i a little bit hit on um uh, perseverance of the saints and at first i was going to kind of lean into it but that's another one coming down the line so i'm like well i don't want to i don't want to steal somebody's show later on and i don't want to kind of repeat what's going before so it it was a good it was a good challenge i'd I'd say yeah this series is i think even um it's even more unique. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be back in the classic service, having been in Vine the entire series. So I, I, yeah. I've been off during the series, but I haven't preached outside of Vine. So I'm going to actually, I think next week I close out the series, interestingly, in classic where I've been in Vine the whole time. So uh, this series, and I've talked to John and Rebecca a little bit about it, is just – and I think this is the, the case with just the whole theological premise of the Ordo Salutis, right? Is we call it an order, but it doesn't actually work orderly, right? Sure. I mean, one has to do with the other. And a lot of it is there's shades of dis- – of, it's shades of distinction and similarity. So like adoption, and we both hit on this in our messages this past week, it has a lot to do with the predestination kind of concept, right? right? Yeah. Because it's about the sovereign choice of God but it's about the sovereign choice, and as I mentioned, the sovereign choice not of strangers but of children. Right. So I think that's where it, it. So now you've shaded it a little bit. So I think that is very, very difficult. But when you're when you're approaching the adoption piece specifically, what is it about it that really kind of excites you about uh, approaching salvation? Um, because one of the cool things about this is we're talking about the total of salvation from a given angle pretty yeah. much every single week, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so what is it about this the, this shade of the Ordo Salutis and the Order of Salvation that really excites you? Yeah, I mean, because and, and you hit it in your message, which this is about family, yeah, right? So it's, it's not just I'm brought – and I didn't really hit on it this – when I preached um, – but I think I've heard so many people say, like, how do you get to heaven? And that's a terrible question because yeah. it's like, how do you get to be with God? Yeah. It, right? That's the end part. The end part is being with God or yeah. not being with God. Heaven is where God is, wherever yeah. God exists. And yes, there's a, you know, a physicality to it as well. But And, and so um, 
adoption hits on that idea of what it means to be brought into a family bigger than themselves. And I'm a weird guy. I love kind of the weird uh, stuff of scripture. But the other part of being brought into the family is there's like a whole angelic side to that family as well that we don't really think about. (laughs) I mean, one day you and I are going to have these weird Buddies. pseudo cousin yeah. <laughs> brothers, whatever they are, that are you know foreheaded, you know eyes everywhere creatures, mm-hmm. and that's gonna be it's gonna be fun to figure out. Yeah, but um, but I, I think that's the biggest thing. I, I think in in both of our messages, um, the the what's been broken is not just the sin barrier, yeah, but is is now the intimacy, the intimacy of, of yeah. being drawn to God, yeah. and I love that. I mean, it's beautiful. Yeah, I think a lot of times we default or we, we reduce salvation to the forgiveness piece, which is obviously a huge – I mean, that's a big part of it. But the forgiveness piece is a vehicle to intimacy and relationship. And that, and that's the thing that I think does often get lost in, like you said, like how do I get to heaven? Or, or um, if you were to die tonight, do you know where you would go? Which, I mean, it's not a bad question, but it, it's yeah. also – it, it it it's a little bit reductionistic and and one of the things i've heard a lot recently with pastors is and this speaks to my heart a lot but it's it's framing salvation in the context of identity right so it's uh, and and for me i did my whole doctoral project on identity yep. um and and so this adoption piece really speaks to the identity of an individual. And one of the, the, the phrases that you used, which I, I wrote down, which I just, I'm going to steal it. I'm just letting you know, and I'm probably not going to give you credit, but I'm giving you credit right now. <laughs> but I loved how you said this. Um, you, you talk about the fact that we orphan ourselves. And I just, I think that that's, because the, the idea of adoption is that we're orphans, which I didn't touch on that image of it, but I, I loved how you put that but it's not that we're orphans because someone else abandoned us we're runaways yes, right yeah. so and, and prodigal I, son yeah right? so i wonder if you'd unpack that kind of idea a little bit more just that idea of orphaning ourselves and yeah. and how that dovetails with this whole idea that god then you know, comes after us. You know, what what was your yeah. kind of thought well, process behind that? Depends yeah. on how deep dive you want to go. I, yeah. I, I think um, in the uh, in the reformed realms, one of the hardest things I've with laymen, um, some of the long conversations I've had with them is right Romans and, and plenty of other places outside of Romans say that we we are born with a sin nature. Yeah. And so what's hard, I think, for some people to conceptualize is, or or I think the way they mistake maybe that idea is, well, I'm being held accountable for what Adam did. Yeah. In some ways you're going, well, in the sense that you are now a person filled with sin, sure. Yeah. But I am never held accountable to what my parents did or what Mm -hmm. Adam did or what the previous generations did. Trust me. I'll run away on my own. Yeah. I I will do all the sinning I'll ever need yeah. to to be orphaned. And so, um, w- one of the reasons I said that in particular is I think some people think I'm being held me personally held accountable for what the generations did before me. And yeah. I, I want to kind of root it back. You know this. Our culture doesn't often want to take responsibility yeah. for ourselves. And, yeah. and the scriptures doesn't play patty cakes with that. It, yeah. It's very like this is – I'm being held accountable for me. And yeah. the truth is, Zach, before Christ, I loved to sin. I yeah. loved it. I yeah. was addicted to it, just yeah. like all of us yeah. are. And so when you're face-to-face with – the consequences i'm not pointing fingers at anybody else i'm looking at myself and going whoa yeah, yeah. i'm i'm capable of that and worse yeah you know? yeah and and it's it, it it really i think until we uh until we really own that yes there is this fallen nature yes there is this this brokenness in the world yes there is original sin uh, I, I think the early reformers really highlight the original sin to the point where even some of and I you know I'm I love John Calvin and I love you know the early reformers but you know when you read someone like um uh you know uh, Augustine right he owns his sin right i mean his biography is called confessions i mean because he's owning the fact that yes he's a yes there's this 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 
bigger cosmic problem of sin that starts with Adam and, and Eve in the Garden of Eden. But that's he's not confessing that sin. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's confessing the ways in which he, you know, he idolized, uh, you know, philosophical thinking and the ways that he, you know, was 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 a you know sexually immoral and, and he, he that's where he's kind of landing yeah. whereas as some of the the reformers later on they almost gloss over it to the to the point of just kind of pointing out original sin and original sin and, and then saying yes yeah and as a result i'm so you know filled with hate and wrath right yeah. uh, but until we say yes i'm a sinner not just because of this original sin we don't really kind of get the weight of yeah, well, adoption. I'll share a quick story. Um, boots on the ground. My, my father was um, was a pastor for a while. In uh, to be honest, he was uh, he was more of an evangelist. In I won't dive into the evangelist world, but but the end result often was just the gospel. Get in, get out. Yeah, and and so what we're talking about is adoption. That's much bigger than that. It's much fuller than that. that yeah. it's not just it's it's your identity shifting, as well as now my entire perception, and therefore what I do and purpose and so forth. And what I realized uh, often in kind of the evangelical world is we would do like door to door witnessing. I hated it. I was like a super <laughs> shy kid, so I'm hiding behind my dad's leg, and he's kind of doing all the talking, right? And I'm just sweating bullets for absolutely no reason, but. What I realized is as he would begin to talk about sin and how that's condemned me and so on and so forth, there was a – you could literally see in their eyes a disconnect yeah. where, they're, where they're, I could almost I, – I didn't hear them say but they were almost saying, no, nah, not me. Yeah. I'm okay. I'm pretty good. Yeah. And, and so I, I realized very quickly – that if if an individual doesn't understand what they're responsible for and what they're doing, and you, how can you unless the perfection of God is brought before you, or even the Ten Commandments? If you got to whittle it down to that point yeah. to go, this is the standard to be human. By the yeah. way, not to you know, um, then then the way that sin manifests within us is you're doing pretty good. You're doing pretty good. You're doing yeah. pretty good. You know, you're yeah. not Kathy. You know, yeah. Kathy, you know. Yeah, she's terrible. And Timmy over there, yeah. you know. <laughs> awful, awful yeah. people. Well, and, and, and I think that that's – and you know there's the there's the holding up the, the the lens of the perfection of God. But then there's also the – I think having the conversation with people to say, be honest – you know, because you know, in the quiet moments, that you might think you're pretty good, but you're just saying that because you don't feel pretty good. Right. Yeah. You, you know the guilt. Um. You you know the, and, and and so where does that where does that internal you know getting people to kind of understand where does that internal guilt come from where does that internal why is it there if you're pretty good, I mean and and so because you know this is the cs lewis kind of mm -hmm. kind of thing from from mere christianity we know that there's a problem we don't like to acknowledge it as he talks about with with the screw tape letters you know just distract them distract them distract them but but we the reason that we fall to the temptation of all that distraction is because we know when we're honest in those quiet moments that we're not pretty good and then and then letting people sit with that for a while mm -hmm. um helps them understand that but but the reason that you feel that is because there's this great standard of goodness yeah. that you you were created to reflect and you know you don't do it perfectly but because God is so awesome and amazing he reaches down he you know the the word that I like to use which I think is because it, it requires explanation is he condescends down to us mm -hmm. and then pulls us up towards his goodness and his perfection it, it's a it's a it's a there is that that thing that has to happen with most people and i wonder as you deal with a generation that has been i think you know just therapied and and you know um medicated and and kind of told their that they're whatever whatever they're thinking feeling wanting to act on mm -hmm. that that's all okay i wonder these are very heavy topics i mean these are very uh big picture kind of biblical topics how do you bridge the gap with them to to talk about things like adoption and 
orphan, you know, mm-hmm. the, how they orphan themselves, and and when they're like, uh, you know, when they're still they're still in that formation period in their minds, you know, they're still thinking conceptually, and these are very conceptual ideas that have real concrete value. But how do you make the 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 connection with some of those 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 concepts? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I think one of the benefits that, well, benefit for them, not so much for the upper generation, is that uh, Gen Z is watching two generations kind of go scorched earth a lot, um, yeah. and so as as they're as they're watching um, the older generations, f- you know, often fumble through what they thought was good or what could be good, mm-hmm. they're already kind of learning and, and taking that in to go, okay, well, success doesn't actually equal happiness, happiness, yeah. right? And so we have actual valid, and now that we're interconnected through Twitter and, and all these platforms, they're they're more exposed to the idea that that there is no like heaven so to speak within within success and money now that doesn't mean that they don't chase the same things that we do yeah so it, it's easier i think actually to talk with gen z about brokenness because not a single one of them is convinced that they're whole or that they have it put yeah. together and, and now on the flip side of it sometimes they hold that as a badge of yeah. honor almost like this is how broken i am and therefore you must meet my needs and and yeah. and, and um uh, help me out, but which is such a pendulum swing. I think, yeah, you know, like huge. One of the things that you know, I in in um, in in the identity project that I did for for my doctorate, in some of the discussions was that you know it used to be um, Charles Taylor talks about the the shift towards the therapeutic, you know, where mm-hmm. sin is no longer sin; it's it's a disease that needs to be healed, and. Uh, actually, my wife was in one of the discussion groups that I did. She goes, and actually, it's not even that anymore. There's a new shift towards I'm proud of my brokenness, and I'm proud of and, – and, you know, sometimes won't even call it brokenness. They'll just say this is this is my identity now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's it, it, curious to hear how you kind of make those connections to, to overcome that. Well, um, I guess the best way to answer that is you can often get lost in the weeds of, um, I wouldn't say nitpicking, but in, in all these various, um, issues that students are, are getting into. I, I, here's what I, here's what I'll answer with. If I go down the layers of feelism, which is what a lot of that generation embraces or, or, um, uh, you know, take me as I am tolerance, that all those sorts of things. I think often I end up in a conversation where I didn't feel super great about it because we're, it's almost like we're attacking the surface issues rather yeah. than the core issues. And so, um, and, and you've said it already, which is at the end of the day, we are orphaned and we are looking to, to be loved Accepted, and, and saved. Yeah. And so if I can point them back to Jesus and I know that sounds like your stereotypical, like sure, uh, pastoral but, answer, but no. but honestly, if if Jesus what else is, is there, the right? answer, what else is there, right? Yeah, yeah, then then He is the answer to the healing. He is the answer to to filling the gaps in your life, to the identity issue, to the purpose issue. Yeah, um, and and so I'm I'm actually confessing that I think in some of, as I, I, as I've looked back at my ministry. Often I've I've maybe spent more time on the weeds than I did going. Hey, what if we dialed it back a little bit? And yeah. went, unless you're adopted in, yeah, this is not going to change. None yeah. of this sanctification happens. Yeah. In fact, none of this even makes sense. That's that's why, you know, uh, I, I believe it was Paul that's like to the unbeliever, this is nonsense. Yeah, this is nonsense, right? and yeah. it is. Like if you yeah. if it face value, it just seems crazy talk. Um, and so, on one end, I am working with teenagers, and so they are very caught up in their day to day stuff. And I do want to answer those issues. Yeah. So, my, so my quick answer is, we'll talk about those bigger feelism issues or whatever they're going through. But honestly, I got I have to go back to Jesus to going. He's going to fulfill the need that you have, yeah. and I have to actually, as a as a youth director or really any kind of shepherding role. I have to be comfortable with the fact that it is the Holy Spirit who is going to do the yeah. transforming and the tweaking and you the, the stirring. Yeah. I can't do that. Yeah. And so often I think we we think we're the ones that yeah. that if we just um, 
teach them enough or out preach them enough, then that's going to really get them. And it's like, no, I got to be comfortable with the Holy Spirit. And the journey may be way longer and way different than mine was. Yeah, and I think that that I think I think that's such a, a a critical point, not just for not just for you know folks in in your field, student ministry, youth ministry, working with with teenagers or you know college age students, but really. All adults, you know, I think so often we we have shifted towards um, we've shifted towards you know behavior modification, um, therapeutic moralism, moralistic deism kind of things, you know, mm-hmm. and less uh, about getting to the heart of it, and then being committed to the long term work of 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 being in community, because we get to this like expectation level that says, well. You know, if you're coming to church, then you need to start acting like a church person, yeah. rather than saying, "Well, you're coming to maybe you're coming to church once in a while, maybe you're coming to Wednesday night youth group or whatever." That doesn't mean you're no. say. I mean, you even talked about it here. Many that you know, Jesus looks at many that say say to me, "Lord, Lord," I will say to t- say to them, "I never knew you." Well, the reason is because you know they've attacked they've they've tried to walk the path of you know, quote unquote Christianity the way the Pharisees tried to walk the walk yeah. with, with Judaism and Jesus had a lot to say about that too, <laughs> you know. And it, it is about a heart issue. It's about a relationship issue. It's about uh, yeah. about the family issue, you know. Well and I think so many of us have approached it from um and I and I'm saying us broadly, not yeah, yeah, yeah. not this particular church, but um I think the end result some of us wanted was civilized people. Yeah. And and you read the Bible and it's no, it's transformed people. Yeah. Right? It's the dying to yourself and reliving yeah. in Christ. It's the picking up your cross. And that's not not as uh, maybe popular in, in, in our current culture, but mm. um, that transformation is literally a miracle in of itself, right? Yeah. That's the beauty of, of yeah. us talking about this order of salvation is Everything is God given and yeah. God gifted. Yeah. So I, I just met with a um, a father the other day, and we were talking about one of his students, and um, he says, "Man, he comes away on Wednesday nights just fired up, but now he has this like list of things that he has to kind of do." And I'm like, "Oh no, because that's never my my intention, intention is yeah. to go. Hey, here's a checklist." And so in our conversation with this father and I, I just said, "You know the the." The, the truth of the matter is he'll never get that list. But if he spends time with Jesus, if he spends time in his word and in mm-hmm. prayer, the Holy Spirit will transform that in yeah. him. And so it's not me hyper-focusing on like, I got to get it right. I got yeah. We'll never do that right. Yeah. It's me spending time with the Father. Yeah. And that's what it means to be a child. So were there things as you're thinking through the adoption conversation on Sunday, Thursday and Sunday, that you were like, man, if I had another 15 or 20 minutes, I'd unpack this aspect of it that you just didn't get to? Yeah, and I actually think you um, – so I'm so grateful that we had two people preaching on it because the, the, the takeaway I got from yours was you were more so focusing on kind of the, the family intimacy aspect of it and yeah. even the weirdness of what it is yeah. to be in this kind of um, dysfunctional family, it feels yeah. like, often. Um, I, I think – now, I knew who my – um, crowd was, yeah. and so I I tend to as a preacher to tailor it to the crowd sure, I'm approaching. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, had I been in Vine, I probably would have pressed more into um, not just the beauty of salvation into the family, but this awesome idea of being unified mm-hmm. with a group that isn't going anywhere. They can't, you know. Yeah. I mean, that sounds crazy, but like yeah. that that we get to be united with people that often the only thing we have in common is the Holy it's Spirit Christ, in yeah, Christ. Yeah. But but also what it means to be anchored in a family for so many people who don't have that. Yeah. And what it means to be so intimate with with God the Father that we can call him, you know, Abba, uh, Abba Father. Yeah. You know, and I, you know, the word dad Daddy to me as a grown man, you know, it's a little it's uncomfortable, hard. right? But but just wait till your son starts saying it all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Then you're it like, becomes yeah. a little different. Yeah. Yeah, then, yeah. then you're like, one day when he starts calling you dad, you're like, no, 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 no I'm let's daddy. Go to, let's yeah. go back to daddy. Yeah, so. <laughs> but, but I love I, and, and you and I both shared that verse. Uh, what was that Romans eight? I think. Yeah, it's from Romans yeah. eight. Yeah, mm-hmm. about the idea that there's no more fear in us yeah. because we get to approach him in that way. Mm-hmm. And I. Zach, I, I don't care how good of a preacher you are. 
unless you've experienced that closeness with God, it's like, I wish I could do a better job of transferring yeah, how can. beautiful and wonderful it is that when I flub it up the most, I still get to go to Abba Father yeah. and go, well, you already knew this was coming down the pipeline, but but I can still have that intimacy yeah. through repentance yeah. rather than the fear. And so, yeah, so that would have been one yeah. of the things I think I would have, uh, if there was a follow-up, I would have wanted to talk yeah. about now that we're adopted and we had swapped the the sanctification, the sanctification and, thing, yeah. and adoption, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, I, I, the only issue I would have in this this whole series is is if it comes off like um, kind of a dry. Yeah. Um, here's the process, and now we're this, and now yeah. instead of the the beauty of what it means to actually be a part of a family. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I, I mean, I and I think for me it was it, I leaned a lot into the family aspect and the family resemblance thing, and and which goes into the sanctification uh, piece, which I, I did preach on the week before, and it does make a lot more sense. There there's some logistical reasons we switched adoption and sanctification, but but really the sanctification piece speaks into the family resemblance piece, right? Um, but for me, the thing that that I left out, which is a huge piece, and we both – you mentioned it, uh, but uh, – and it really goes into next week's message, but it's this idea of having an inheritance, right? You, don't, you only grab an in- inheritance if you're, you know, related to uh, somebody, right? It's yeah. it's your, your grandparents, your parents pass that down to you, and, and what does that inheritance look like? I mean um, – so that 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 and that that becomes a whole big you know thing in 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 Romans, but also especially in in the book of Galatians, and so it, that that whole idea I think is is critical to the understanding the weight of adoption, which we just just you know, but you only have you know so long twenty five thirty minutes, and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, as much well, as as much as you like to think you can hold people's attention for forty five right. or fifty minutes and and put in more and more theology, you lose them you eventually. Know, yeah. um, they're gonna be like, yeah, well, and that yeah. and that's the beauty of a series, right? Yeah. Is you can kind of unpack these different aspects. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it is the challenge though to bringing in multiple speakers because yeah. I think if it was an individual, you would you would have the space to kind of yeah. press in where, where yeah. needed. Absolutely. Well, Josh, man, I, I so appreciate you hanging out for a little bit and uh, look forward to hearing you preach next time, which yeah, won't, won't, be, won't be too long down the pike. Uh, for anyone who missed Josh's message, uh, check out fpclakeland.org under the uh, worship tab. You'll see the sermon archives page, and he was in the classic service. If you missed my message and you'd like to check that out, same same page, but it'd be under the modern worship tab. And if you missed any one of our episodes of Armchair Preaching, be sure to check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Google Play, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. Subscribe, hit the like button, share it with your friends. Lots of good conversations around this deep, deep stuff. And uh, Josh, thanks for adding your insight to it and a perspective that is very unique. And uh, we look forward to having you back next time. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you again soon.